People of God, the Holy Gospel for you according to John. Glory, Glory, Glory to you, Lord. Lord. At that time, the festival of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I have told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me. But you do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I, we are one. This is the gospel, the good news of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Alleluia, Christ is risen. All right, that was nice and strong. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and from Jesus the Christ in whom we live and move and have our being. Let the people of God say, Amen. Amen. We're going to talk about sheep today and about mothers too because it's not only Good Shepherd Sunday today, it's also Mother's Day. So let me confess right from the beginning that I know precious little about sheep, next to nothing actually, or about the age-old profession of shepherding for that matter. But of course I do know about mothers. After all, I had one myself for a total of 59 years of my life, and I miss her terribly since she died on New Year's Eve 2013. But, but I know nothing about the way of life of a shepherd out there in the pastures, you know, surrounded by animals and fending off the ferocious wolves. And I suspect that this is true for many of you too, that you're kind of in the same boat because sheep and shepherds are just so far removed from our everyday urban and suburban life that we lead, even in a state as rural as North Carolina. See, we preachers sometimes worry that the images we use and the metaphors that we employ really need to relate to the people, right? They need to come out of, their, out of their lives so that images of sheep and shepherds are, I guess, somewhat problematic because they are just so far removed from where we are at. I mean, when's the last time you saw a sheep around here? And, and I don't mean on TV or in the pages of National Geographic. I, I mean a real life sheep in Cary, North Carolina. Sheep don't usually cross the streets of Cary the way these annoying geese do, right? <laughs> and shepherds haven't been known to show up at RTP lately either. By the way, this little geese family here is camping out on the roof of our church. <laughs> I took this picture on Easter morning, and I bet these cute little geese babies were born up there. I, I can't quite imagine how else they might have gotten up there on the roof. But back to sheep. This idea that Jesus is a shepherd, a good shepherd, is not such an easy thing for us to relate to. But for the people in Jesus' day, that was their daily life. They saw shepherds all the time. And it is a beloved tradition in the church and rightfully so. Think about Psalm 23, which we just read together. It's universally loved, and if folks are able to recite any scripture passage by memory, it's likely to be Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still water. He restores my soul, though I walk through the shadow of the valley of death. So today is the fourth Sunday of Easter which is traditionally celebrated as Good Shepherd Sunday, but it's Mother's Day too, and so we're going to talk about both shepherds and mothers and discover some commonalities between the two, and we're going to talk about the overwhelming love of a mothering God who to us is a good and reliable shepherd. So maybe this image of the little geeslings, gooselings, how do you say that? Goslings, is that the word? This image of these little goslings 
isn't such a bad example of, of love that is reaped, received unconditionally, even on the roof of a church. To start with, look around our worship space. You know, it's a little bit like your house, right? You get so used to it, you see it all the time, but you miss the little things that make your house a home. You kind of take it for granted. So look around. Come on, look around. Nobody's moving. Look around. Notice the seven banners that we have hanging in our beautiful sanctuary. You've seen them before, no doubt, but have you paid attention? Do you know what they say? Can you tell me why there are seven of these banners? Oh, you said that in the early service too. You can't do it twice, Mike. <laughs> you only get one gold star. Anyway, he's right. There are seven I am sayings. And these seven banners represent those sayings of Jesus when Jesus says, I am the gate of the sheep, and I am the vine, and I am the good shepherd, and so on. I'll, I'll show you those sayings in just a moment. But first, let's consider that there's great significance in the I am part of Jesus' statement. Because you see, in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, God sends Moses to the Egyptian pharaoh, right? demanding that he let the people of Israel go. And, and when Moses asks, who shall I say sent me? God answers, I am who I am. Well, that's a bit of a cryptic answer, don't you think? So this is how the Jewish tradition started that claims that God hasn't got a name, or if God does, that God's name is too holy to speak, which is why the Old Testament calls God Yahweh, deliberately without the vowel, so it's not a proper word. We get the word Jehovah from this. There's also Hebrew tradition of the seven names of God. There is seven again, right? The seven names of God called the Tetragrammaton, all so holy that once written, they cannot be erased. Well, when Jesus says, I am, he picks up on that. He picks up on that history, and of course, the people who were listening to him would immediately have made that connection, right, to the I am sayings in the Old Testament. The phrase I am turns up in the Bible more than 300 times. So when Jesus begins his seven sayings, seven, note the number, with I am, he alludes to the sacred name of God as well as to his own identity. So are you with me so far? Make sense? All right. So here they are, the seven I am sayings. And as I read them, I'd invite you to look around and see that we have seven banners here in the church, one for each. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door for the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. Well, today on this Good Shepherd Sunday, let's unpack this image of Jesus as a shepherd for just a bit. You see, in Jesus' times, people who were listening to him would have had a definite idea what it was he was talking about when he said that. First of all, this idea of a good and benevolent shepherd for the people was an image for the king. David was a shepherd boy, right? We know that. And he turned into one of the most important and impactful kings in the history of the Hebrew people. So it's no coincidence that a king carries a scepter as the you know, symbol of the king's power. That's originally the shepherd's staff, which gives the shepherd status and his power, and is a very useful tool to fend off wolves and other predators with the one end, but also a way for the shepherd to rescue stray sheep and pull them out of the ditch with the other. That's, that's why there is a crook at the end. In, in the Christian church, this image of the shepherd's staff carried through, and many of our bishops carry a staff called a crozier as a sign of their office. Here are two fun photos to give you an idea of what a crozier looks like. See, when I was serving as bishop up in Maryland and Delaware, they gave me a crozier. And I was always like that, unlike some others that I have seen, mine really was like a shepherd's staff. It had a crook. Did you see, did you see that in the picture? Bishops and pastors 
are considered shepherds, right? In, in fact, in Spanish, the word for shepherd is, anybody know? It's pastor. They don't have two separate words there. So in the ears of Jesus' audience, he's saying, I am the good shepherd, would have immediately evoked images of the benevolent king, the, the good ruler. But there's another side to the story as well. You see, in Jesus' time, shepherds, the real ones out there in the fields, were very much looked down upon. They were considered shifty people, unreliable fellows whom you could not trust. You'd shoo your kids back into the house when the shepherd came down the street with his flock for fear that he might somehow hurt them in some way or, or maybe even, you know, snatch them up and take them with them. They weren't the cleanest people either, living out there in the pasture for weeks on end without a toothbrush and a bath. They smelled bad, to say the least. And their social status was non-existent. They were, to be sure, at the bottom of the totem pole. This was, of course, true for women as well. Like shepherds, they were considered unreliable. Women couldn't testify in court unless there was a second witness, preferably a man, of course, to corroborate their testimony. Women in Jesus' day were just a tad higher than shepherds in the social order, but not by much. And yet, both shepherds and women, mothers especially, in Scripture and in real life, stand for caring and for nurturing, for providing unconditional love to the creatures in their care. I, I love this picture of a female shepherd in Greece combining both shepherding and mothering. Is, is there a word like shepherdess or something? I, I tried to Google that, and all I got was the difference between a male German shepherd and a female German shepherd, unless... I think that's a thing. I mean, they had all these articles about that and why one was better than the other. But I didn't find anything on a, on a human shepherdess. But I'm going to go with it. I like that word. A shepherd or a shepherdess will go out of their way to track down a lost sheep. And a mother loves her baby without condition and provides for their every need. Now, we also have to say that because of our broken humanity, of course, that means that there are exceptions. Parents, mothers even, can be abusive or neglect those in their care. The world and the court system are full of heartbreaking stories where caregivers turn into care withholders or worse, perpetrators. But generally, generally, and this is true especially on Mother's Day, mothers are seen as loving and caring and nurturing, providing for the most vulnerable. And that is why we have this day set aside to honor them. We should, of course, honor them every day. Not just on a special holiday like Mother's Day. And how about if we considered honoring women in our society by recognizing them as equal to men in every way? Which even in our supposedly enlightened and liberal democracy still has not been achieved. See, you don't have to go to Afghanistan and witness all the restrictions that the Taliban are bringing back against women and against the education of girls. In our own country, just last year, Virginia became the 38th state to adopt the Equal Rights Amendment, but it was too late, the courts ruled, and the period during which states could vote for this proposed constitutional amendment had long since expired. And so at least the letter of the law still does not enshrine the equality of men and women. And our gender non-conforming siblings are even more discriminated against. State law after state law is being passed to force transgender people to conform to one gender or the other, just not the one that they recognize as their true self. I'd have to say that North Carolina's infamous bathroom bill apparently was just the beginning. Truth be told, we are far from equal, far from equality between the genders when it comes to men, women, and especially the trans community. 
Whenever these debates on gender equality rage, people are quick to turn to the Bible and claim that Scripture has established or at least condoned the inequality that we are seeing. We've got to be honest, they have a point. The Bible was written by men, for men, in a patriarchal world, and so it's full of male characters from Abraham and Moses on down. But what we so often forget is that Abraham wouldn't have been possible without his Sarah or Moses without his Miriam. Fact is, the Bible is full of female characters who advance God's mission in the world. And it's not just Mary Magdalene who becomes the first witness to Jesus' resurrection. There are so many others. So listen up, the plot thickens. Are you still following along? You're with me? All right. So just yesterday, I came across an interesting article in the Christian Century. That's a magazine which, by the way, is edited by Lutheran pastor Peter Maury. The article was about a theologian, an artist by the name of Kara Quinn. Had never heard of her before. You probably haven't either. Well, this woman, after graduating from Fuller Theological Seminary, she combined her background in advertising and design with her newly acquired theological training, and, and she created what I think are the most stunning modern icons of women in the Bible. And there are plenty of them. Eve, Rachel, Bathsheba, Ruth, Sarah, several Marys, Martha, Joanna, Priscilla, Tabitha, or Dorcas, whose story we read just a little earlier in the service. It's just not true that the Bible only has heroes. There are lots of heroines, too. I think, to me, the, the most interesting of, the, of her icons is the one entitled Spirit, Mother God, Father God. It's the second from uh, left in the top row. And it helps us to maybe expand our male-dominated image that we have of God. Think about this for a minute. Even though more often than not, we think of God as our Father, and there is, of course, nothing wrong with picturing God as a loving and giving Father, but even so, we do that all the time. God is not male, just in case you'd wondered. <laughs> God is not female either, and he also is in both. God is God. And we probably understand about this much of this God who is this big, right? But because we are humans and therefore have limited understanding, we need to find a way to think about God in terms that we can understand. So a father figure is something we can relate to. But on this Mother's Day... I want to invite you to think of God in a more expansive way. Father, of course, but maybe also as mother and as sibling and as friend. We are all created imago Dei in the very image of God, so surely God reflects the amazing and wondrous diversity that humanity enjoys. Caring nurturing, shepherding, embracing the overwhelming love of our mothering God envelops us today and on all days of our lives and beyond. The good news, siblings of Christ, the good news is that this mother God, like a good shepherdess, will not let us go and will not let us die. Jesus, the good shepherd, in today's gospel lesson, is adamant about that. My sheep hear my voice, he says. I know them, he says. They follow me, he says. I give them eternal life. Are you listening? And they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand, Jesus says. So siblings in Christ, rest assured in the knowledge that God will gather you as a mother gathers her chick. Or a mother goose gathers her goslings in the arms of an ever-loving, mothering God. It's the good news. It's the best news there is. And to that, let the people of God say, Amen. Amen.